What's up Suns fans, or any other general NBA fans who may be stumbling upon this video. My name is Sam from the Timeline Podcast, and this is part two of our 2020 free agency scouting breakdown series, where we take a closer look at some of our favorite free agent targets. Today is all about one of the most athletic guys in the NBA, but can he do enough of the other stuff to be a valuable signing? Let's break down Nuggets forward, Jeremy Grant. Just like the first player I covered in this series, Christian Wood, Jeremy Grant is a byproduct of the process era Sixers. That means, like many of the players drafted by Philly during that era, he was drafted for only one reason, because he is an uber-athletic freak. Monster put-back dunks and vicious posters basically carried Grant to being a second-round draft selection back in 2014, and it didn't matter to Philly at the time that he couldn't shoot. In fact, Grant attempted just 23 pointers total in two seasons with Syracuse. So it wasn't a surprise when Grant came to the NBA and didn't display dead-eye shooting right off the bat. Although he did start firing away on a more routine basis with the Sixers, Grant shot just 27% from three-point range in his first two years with the team. It really wasn't until last season with the Thunder that Grant took his shooting to the next level. Let's flash back to the 2019 playoffs real quick, with the Thunder taking on the Blazers in round one. Grant had shot the hell out of the ball all season long, knocking down a career-high 39% of his threes, and in game three of this series, which was the only OKC win, Grant demonstrated just how far he had come from simply being a high-level athlete. He scored 18 points as OKC's starting power forward, but more importantly knocked down four out of five threes. This one game was the purest confirmation of all of Jeremy Grant's hard work paying off, proof that he could exist as a modern type of offensive contributor in a high-stakes environment. And once his shooting really was that consistent, even more of his game opened up this year in Denver. Continuing first with the trend of shooting, Grant knocked down a career-high 40% of his threes for the Nuggets this year on just about three and a half attempts per game. This was the predominant way that Denver used Grant on offense, which is another testament to just how far he's come. Grant logged more spot-up shooting possessions than any other Denver player and ranked in the 64th percentile league-wide in spot-up efficiency. There are no bells and whistles here. Grant is not an off-movement shooter, and he doesn't dribble into pull-ups. But he's got a nice, high release point on his shot, and after several consecutive years of improvement, it makes sense to buy into his value as a legit catch-and-shoot guy. After shooting, the obvious place where you're going to find value in Grant is in transition and as a cutter. Playing with Nikola Jokic as a fellow big is such a privilege because Jokic forces so much attention in the high elbow area that all Grant had to do was run along the baseline waiting for dunks. There's a legit skill in being able to finish off these plays though, and Grant's finishing talent speaks for itself, as he ranked 76th percentile in efficiency on cuts. Meanwhile in transition, Grant is the perfect lob catching counterpart to any pass first guard. He's a strong leaper off of either one or both feet, and a strong finisher with either one or both hands. Literally nothing not to like about having him run the floor, and it's going to lead to some pretty exciting highlight plays. You'll notice that all of the positive skills we've covered so far don't require a whole lot of dribbling. That's important because dribbling is not something that Jeremy Grant does a whole lot of. In fact, according to the NBA's dribbles per touch statistic, Grant even dribbles less frequently than his center teammate Mason Plumley. Or to make a Suns comparison for the many Suns fans following this channel, he dribbles about as often as Cam Johnson. That doesn't mean he's totally unwilling to dribble. On the contrary, Grant is more than happy to attack closeouts. And sometimes that leads to breathtaking results. Unfortunately, most of the time it leads to stuff more closely resembling this. An awkward handle, and a guy who either gets himself into trouble with nowhere to go, or else who throws up hopelessly clunky floaters. I've seen Grant try this floater plenty of times, and it's basically never gone in. In general, what we can say about Grant's offensive impact is that he struggles as a self-creator. This puts him in sharp contrast with Christian Wood, who we covered in the last video. Whereas Wood possesses the handle to make you buy into a potentially higher ceiling, Grant is mostly a role player. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that because he's a highly efficient, really good role player. But that role needs to be kept simple in order for him to flourish. I would say the one exception to this rule may be in the post, 
where we saw some encouraging stuff this season. Grant only posted up about once per game, so it's not a huge part of his offense, but we know that he's not a timid player, and if he sees a mismatch on a guard, he's going to exploit that for an easy bucket. Moving on to defense now, which is actually the thing that got this guy drafted in the first place. Every team that hopes to go deep into the playoffs is looking for the same thing. Maybe in one year, we call it a LeBron stopper. In another year, we might call it a Durant stopper. Right now, it might be a Kawhi or a Giannis stopper. There's so many guys who have undeservedly earned this type of nickname, and now I'm going to go ahead and add Jeremy Grant to the mix. Why? Well, I direct you back to a pivotal Denver win against the Clippers in early January, where Grant played some of the best defense I have literally ever seen on Kawhi Leonard. To be clear, Kawhi still poured 30 points in during this game, but in possessions where he was matched up against Grant, he shot just 2 for 9 from the field. In possessions against any other member of the Nuggets, he was 10 for 16. And I recognize that this is only one example, but you can dig up plenty of other examples of Grant guarding all of the league's best and not necessarily locking all of them up, but at least bothering them with his length. On the other hand, when talking about Grant's defense, there's an elephant in the room that needs to be addressed. That's the fact that advanced defensive metrics did not like him this year at all. In fact, the Nuggets' defensive rating was actually far worse with Grant on the floor than it was with Paul Millsap. So what gives? Is it possible that Jeremy Grant has bad defensive advanced stats and is still a good defender? The answer to that, in my humble opinion, is yes. If you watch this channel, then you know that I'm a big stats guy. But this is one particular example where some additional context is needed. For starters, keep in mind that a lot of advanced defensive metrics consider defensive rebounding to be a part of defense. Now, rebounding is definitely not the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of defense, but it is true that if you hand the other team extra possessions, they will make you pay. And unfortunately, this is Jeremy Grant's one massive weakness. Grant, who is again a power forward, ranked 14th on his own team in defensive rebounding rate. He also averaged a career low 4.9 rebounds per 36 minutes this season. So it's not so much that Grant isn't a fundamentally sound defender when it comes to using his length on ball or playing help side defense when off ball. He absolutely is. Rather, it's that none of that stuff matters if you work hard for 24 seconds to force a miss and then allow your opponent to score on a putback. Ultimately, here's why none of that bothers me going forward. In the modern NBA, in the playoffs, things become less about size and they become more about versatility. And as the focus shifts towards locking down the other team's primary weapon, I think Grant's value is really going to shine in a playoff setting, and I think his inability to rebound might be overlooked. Grant is totally built for playoff basketball, and on that stage, I think there's no doubt that he has a positive impact on the defensive side overall. There's one more surprising thing about Grant that I need to share with the world, and that's his ability to play some spot minutes at the five. At just six foot eight, you wouldn't expect Grant to really go toe to toe with most NBA centers. But in late January, some bad timing meant that both Paul Millsap and Mason Plumley were injured at the same time, and suddenly Grant was thrust into backup center minutes, in addition to playing heavy minutes at power forward. The surprising thing here is that the Nuggets were really good with Grant at center. Not just good, but really good. Specifically, they had a kick-ass plus 11.6 net rating in over 100 minutes with Grant as a small ball five. He formed this amazing pairing with the rookie Michael Porter Jr., who was at power forward, and also gave credence to this idea that Jeremy Grant could even be more versatile than previously thought. Just some food for thought going forward as you think about his potential fit on your favorite team. Now, as we start to wind down here, here's the perspective of my podcast partner, Mike V. Hill, to talk about his feelings on how Jeremy Grant would fit in with the Phoenix Suns specifically. There's four main power forward options for the Suns in this free agency, and Grant might be the most role player -y of all four guys. He probably has the lowest individual ceiling when it comes to scoring as well, but part of me thinks he might be the best fit out of all of the four. His defense is strong and he can defend multiple positions. His shooting is good but doesn't command the type of gravity as others might, and he's a threat in transition. But as far as fit goes, as Mikhail Bridges and Cam Johnson develop into efficient scores, maybe a low usage versatile defender playing a role would be better than a high usage player taking shots away from others. This probably says more about my feeling about building an offense around Booker and Ayton than it does about Grant. 
If his rebounding was better, the argument in favor of his fit would be an easy one to make. All in all, he'd be an excellent addition to the Suns that would allow them some positional versatility across the roster, and although he wouldn't be number one on my list, that doesn't necessarily mean he wouldn't potentially be the best fit, especially if he's the cheapest of the four. And that's all for us today. Drop a comment below with your thoughts on Jeremy Grant. If you'd like to continue following along with our free agent series, make sure to subscribe. And if you're a Suns fan, you can also check out our weekly podcast. I'll drop a link to that in the description. Until next time, guys.